Daredevil as a character in comics has undergone so many changes and reinventions over the years. Today, I'm continuing a five-part series wherein I talk about five influential runs that all added to the character of Matt Murdock. Miller, Nocenti, Bendis, Brubaker, and Wade. These five authors will each receive an in-depth video detailing their runs and what each added to the character of Daredevil by trialing him and by expanding his worldview and viewpoints. This series will not be in publication order, but once it's complete, I'll create a playlist with said order for ease of understanding. Today, I'll be diving into the most hopeful take on the Horned Hero in Mark Wade's Daredevil. Beware, there will be spoilers ahead, but if you don't care about that or have read the book, then you're good to go. Without further ado, my name is Character Studied, and let's begin. In the wake of Ed Brubaker's run and the incredibly dark, violent, and outright depressing tale of Shadowland, the one where Matt Murdock is quite literally possessed by the devil and forced to lead the ancient ninja army known as the Hand, Marvel hired Mark Wade, famous for his work on DC titles such as Kingdom Come and the Wally West iteration of The Flash. Wade came onto the book in the July of 2011 and his first issue read as a far cry from the dark, depressed, and struggling Matt of the past few decades. No longer was Hell's Kitchen a dark, dirty, and grimy city nobody would think to live in. For the first time since the 70s, Matt Murdock's world was full of bright colours, silly villains, and a more hopeful attitude to the lead hero. But Wade was smart in how he approached his sudden shift in aesthetics and tone, as the shift is noticeable not only to the reader, but to longtime friend Foggy Nelson as well. And this is where Mark Wade's Daredevil reveals its subtext. The four-year, 54-issue run, which is split across two volumes, isn't about any external threat or foe. Instead, the entire run is dedicated to Matt's internal growth as a character, and how he overcomes the past traumas in his life, and how he handles the various forms of pain he undergoes. These forms include a falling out with Foggy, the loss of his secret identity, and a particular story-driven fight with the Purple Children. Let's begin with... Foggy. When Mark Wade started writing Daredevil, he knew that in order to sell readers on Matt's jarring shift in attitude, this attitude had to be jarring for everyone including Matt's closest friend, Foggy Nelson. As the book opens, full of brightly drawn and vibrant locations and characters by Paulo Rivera, it's clear that the book, at least from the visual standpoint, is becoming less like the gritty crime dramas Batman would frequently tell, and more like the character's swashbuckling roots. The first sign of this carefree attitude buckling occurs in a thought chain after Matt's past affects a case that they were working on. Next time I'll be ready. Next time I'll dodge the press. Next time I won't embarrass Foggy. This echoes Matt's expression to Foggy in the backup issue of Wade's first story, as Matt explains his new carefree attitude to his partner. Sometimes in my dreams, just sometimes, I can see. What do you see? That I want to live. This is how I choose to cope. Is that acceptable to you? I'm not sure. The next instance in which Foggy believes Matt has lost his mind occurs when the Mole Man disturbs the gravesite of Matt's late father, Jack Murdock. As Foggy states, the old Matt? This would have spiralled him who knows which way, huh? This is followed by Matt hearing a Black Spectre agent who disappears before Matt can reach him. Foggy then begins worrying when Matt calls out, Don't use that tone, Foggy. I'm not crazy. I'm not. Foggy eventually finds the remains of Jack Murdock in Matt's desk, a shock to them both, and he fires Matt under the belief he's not mentally well. This is where Wade's run began being illustrated by Chris Samney, who established himself as the main artistic force behind Wade's stories. Matt's case for being mentally healthy isn't helped when he returns home and finds his ex-wife Miller Donovan in his bed. Matt calls Foggy and asks him to go to the facility she's being held at where, sure enough, she hasn't moved. This is revealed to be the work of Coyote, a thug who was given the powers of the teleporting spot, but at this point it's too late. Matt storms away from Foggy and his law firm because he's enraged that his best friend had so little faith in him. It's also at this point that it's revealed Matt still feels guilty for Miller's condition and writes her countless letters apologizing for his actions, detailing how he'll never forgive himself for failing her. Whilst this happens as a result of Foggy's drunken fears, he alerts Matt's current love interest, Assistant DA Kirsten McDuffie, that Matt is in fact Daredevil, and she utilizes the now superior Spider-Man to attack Matt for his own safety. At the end of this issue, Matt repairs his relationship with Foggy by admitting he is flawed and keeps secrets. Not out of necessity, but out of habit, because it makes him feel more in control in a set of increasingly out of control events that make up his life. Foggy then reciprocates Matt's honesty with his own, and admits that he's being tested for cancer. The following issue where his results are revealed contain three of the most devastating panels in the entire run. Poor Foggy though, he's trying to play it cool. 
but his heart beats so loud, I don't even recognize it. It's... It's not Foggy's. Matt then fights assassin Ikari, who beats him within an inch of his life and, with Foggy's help, discovers who's been attacking him since the beginning of Wade's run. Matt stops him, and the story ends with Foggy and Matt having a conversation, with Foggy revealing he no longer thinks Matt is crazy, only fearless. Foggy's cancer continues to be something Matt struggles with, particularly the spells of the chemicals that are involved in his therapy. But he does what he can to support him and face a secret society infecting New York's justice system. When Matt asks Doctor Strange if a spell could help Foggy and is met with a negative response, he says to himself, For the first time in months, I find myself in the familiar, paralyzing grip of overwhelming depression. Then I get over it. This speaks to his development as a character because instead of being put in a position where he can't do anything, Matt formulates a plan to save Foggy and end the serpents. This plan heavily relies on the termination of Matt's secret identity. Matt's secret identity in this run is a frequently returned to concept as it sparks Matt's romance with assistant DA Kirsten McDuffie. Prior to Mark Wade's run, Matt had his identity revealed to the world, but over the years he has fallen into a state where some people believe he's Daredevil, but publicly Matt denies it. This comes to a head in his relationship with Kirsten, as when they meet, Matt denies everything, even taking a pen to the face. This relationship continues to develop all under the pretense that Matt is Daredevil, but continually denies it. Even with the intervention of Spider-Man, Matt pretends he isn't the man without fear. However, it isn't just Kirsten who knows of Matt's identity. The villains like the organization Black Spectre, Coyote, and Ikari all use Matt's secret identity against him and his friends to further tear at Matt's security and sanity. This secret identity crisis comes to be a big plot point when it's revealed a racist secret society of the serpents have infiltrated New York's justice system. And the only way for Matt to beat the society and get them out of the system is to reveal to everybody that he is in fact Daredevil. Matt succeeds and the serpents are forced out of the courts, but so too is Murdoch himself. Without the ability to practice law in New York, Matt is forced to move his firm to San Francisco with Kirsten in tow, the pair now officially dating with Matt's newfound honesty. Upon arriving to San Francisco, Matt immediately helps the police as a consultant and as a superhero in the public eye. His first task from the commissioner is to tackle the Shroud, another blind vigilante who is more aggressive and more insane than Murdoch. The pair go after the latest kingpin in San Francisco, the Owl. The Owl utilizes his knowledge of Matt's secret identity and that of the Shroud to get the older vigilante to attack the horned hero. Though Matt defeats him, this issue of his secret identity becomes something Matt uses to his benefit when Kirsten's father, a renowned author, asks Matt for an autobiography to publish, which allows Matt to blend his Daredevil and Matt Murdock personas. This leads to the finale of the book, in which Matt's double life as Matt Murdock and Daredevil lead to the Kingpin kidnapping Kirsten and Foggy, and Matt feeling the trauma and regret for putting the people in his life at risk, and the fear that him publishing his autobiography will put the people he cares for most at risk further. Foggy is quick to shut this belief down and tells him that Matt's belief that he can make an unjust world fair is exactly the kind of arrogance that keeps people in his life. And maybe there's something to that. The idea that even though realistically one person can't change the world, they can always attempt to make a small dent. And if we all make a small dent, maybe that could become some real change. But enough about that. I want to talk about my favourite section of Mark Wade's run. The Purple Children. This is where the book shines in my opinion, as the themes of overcoming trauma and the triumph of the human spirit are really on display. The basic premise involves the children of the purple man, a man who can force others to do anything he wants, and how their powers differ from his. Instead of forcing actions upon people, they force emotions. This affects Matt particularly, as earlier in the issue Foggy mentions Matt writing an autobiography will force him to relive all the trauma of Born Again, Losing Karen, Electra, and Miller. These emotions that Matt brushes off come back to hit him hard, as he feels the pain of his lost physical encounters, the grief of losing Karen, the rage of being imprisoned, the loneliness of losing his father, and the despair of Foggy's cancer. This overwhelming panic escalates into Matt's inner monologue, becoming increasingly hopeless until... Happy Matt is just an act. That's all it ever was. And I can't pull it off anymore. I can't move. I can't breathe. I can't do anything. This depression continues into the next issue, with Matt lying in an empty space. He describes it as, The people who mean the most to you reaching out, but you can't reach back. At its worst, you are numb. You are drained. You have nothing. Until Matt strikes back against the Purple Man. That, that I know how to fight. Get up. 
You have momentum now. Don't lose it. Don't let the shadows pull you back in. Inertia is the enemy. Do something. Move. Move, Matthew. And how does he move? What's the first step Matt takes to beat his overwhelming sadness? He smiles. And as he states, Okay, that's a start. Matt proceeds to beat the purple man and rescue his children, but the true ending to the story comes when Kirsten accompanies him home and Matt insists to her that he's fine and okay after everything. But as he enters his apartment, the color palette noticeably grows blue and colder, as if Matt is once again unable to reach out to the people who love him. Except he does. He calls Kirsten, who immediately tells him that she knew he wasn't okay. He tells her he just wants to talk and that she doesn't have to come over, at which point she reveals she never left. Matt opens the door, and Kirsten tells him, Thanks for letting me in. Wade's story on Daredevil is perhaps the most optimistic and hopeful since the character's debut, but its modern storytelling sensibilities, reliance on Matt's internal struggle with happiness and sanity over external threats, and the continual hopefulness and choice to be happy in spite of hard life circumstances, make Wade's run something truly special in the Daredevil library. In these trying times, I think something like Wade's run is important, which is why I moved it up in my scheduled videos, because I wanted to share an uplifting story from my favourite medium that really encapsulates the spirit of enduring and remembering that you're never alone. Even in isolation, you can pick up and call the people that mean the most to you, or share laughs with your friends. As Matt says at the close of this run, I may not have eyes, but for the love of God, I'm not blind. Thank you for watching. Sorry this one was longer than usual, I just thought that with the current state of things a bit of optimism was called for. Feel free to leave a comment letting me know what you thought, and I hope you enjoyed.